Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel. If you're new to my channel, hello, my name is Caitlin. This is my, my dog O'Reilly, he's a good boy, he's a good boy. And today we are going to be talking about the Salem Witch Trials. My last video we are talking about um, the history of mental asylums and a lot of that like took place like up north and all. So we're just traveling back in time yet again. So everyone pull on, everyone pull on your little, little seat belt. We're going to be taking off back in time to the year 16 something or other. I think it's 1693, 1692. Yes. So, the Salem Witch... Yes, I was right. I was right. It was 1692. Sorry. The Salem Witch Trials actually, like, occurred back in the spring of 1692 is when it started. So, it all began back in Salem Village, Massachusetts. So there was a group of young girls, and they were all claiming to be possessed by the devil. So Salem, we're gonna we're gonna talk a little bit about Salem and what all happened there. <laughs> Riley, get down! You so, you just want to pop up and say hi. So Salem is a historic coastal town, and it is in. Essex County, Massachusetts. And that's not to be confused with Essex County, New Jersey, where we were talking about the Essex County Hospital Center, aka the Overbrook Asylum in the last video. That's completely different. We're talking about a different place. So we're talking about Massachusetts. And there there was a settlement from the U Europeans that actually was in Salem in the year of 1626. So there was a big settlement back then. So Salem ended up becoming one of the most important uh, seaports in American history. So that's really, that's kind of cool, right? And Salem is actually home to many tourist areas. I'm talking about like, wow. So we have the House of the Seven Gables. That was around during the uh, Salem Witch Trials. Then you had the Salem State University, which college. You had Pioneer Village. Salem Maritime National Historic Site. I don't know. I'm not exactly sure what that is. I wasn't able to look everything up. Um, Salem Willows Park and the Peabody Essex Museum. So th there was a lot of shit that was that makes um, Salem pretty popular. So most, uh, but most of the ident its identity in Salem, Massachusetts, revolves around the 1692 witch trials. So that's very big and popular. In that area, which in all honesty, if that would have happened in my hometown or where I'm living now or anyone's town, y'all would be talking about too. Oh my God, did you hear back in like 1692, almost like 400 years ago, um, we hung people. Yeah, we said they were witches. The talk of the town, right? Right. <laughs> so I'm, I'm so sorry I'm laughing. It's just kind of weird that they still like make their lives around the Salem witch trials that happened back then. It was just nuts. So Native Americans still lived in the northeastern Massachusetts for thousands and thousands of years before the um, colonists even arrived. So like we're talking about like a lot of years, man, a lot of years. And the peninsula of Penins peninsula penin please correct correct me if I'm wrong. Is it peninsula peninsula? <sighs> A land that eventually become Salem was known as Naum Keg. So Naum Keg was basically um, a major settlement for the indigenous people. Known as Naum Keg, Naum Keg people. I'm so sorry if I'm like butchering this butchering this name. I don't know how to pronounce it to save my life. So I'm so sorry about that. So sorry. So the Salem witch trials actually started in January of 1692. And it began with the daughter and the niece of the Reverend Samuel Paris of Sa uh, Salem Village becoming ill. So back then, we're gonna be we're talking about the Puritans, all right? Back then, you know, there's a lot of Puritans, but we're gonna be talking about this day. So everyone, sit down, buckle up, let's get ready to talk about the Puritans. So the Puritans were industrious people who virtually they just made everything by hand. We're talking about the furniture. Like, they made stoves by hand. They didn't have stoves. They didn't even have stoves back then, but they did basically everything by hand. And they were, like, a typical 
Pearson family lived a very humble lifestyle. So basically they would live in one room houses and there was a fireplace within the one room house and it would be used for both cooking and heating during the fall and the winter. So, but of course, you know, back in those days, they didn't have any, uh, you know, bathrooms in the house. So you had to use either an outhouse or a chamber pot. A chamber pot was basically like a pot, you know, where you would cook your meals in that people basically like peed and pooped in and threw up in. And then they rinse it out and then they eat it out of it. Pretty nasty, pretty nasty stuff there. So because it was a one room's home, whenever they would cook, it, the home would become like extremely smoky because they didn't have windows back then. So it would become smoky and like very thick and hard to breathe. And that especially happened back in the winter time because you know it's so cold in Massachusetts that they had to keep fires to keep warm. And it's just, I can, I can only imagine, like they probably had like so many people that had issues with their lungs, you know? And during the winter time, it was extremely important to find firewood. Like that was like a big task. Like, man, if you could get firewood, you the savior of the day, huh, Riley? Savior of the day. And so a lot of the family members, you know, they would often sleep on makeshift mattresses made out of straw. So they didn't have like what we have, like stuffing and cotton and all that. No, they used straw, like from hay. And so during the winter time, it was extremely common for like family members to sleep underneath like mountains and mountains of um, cloth and you know blankets and stuff to keep warm because it was so freaking cold. And they, back then, of course, there's no such thing as heating, air conditioning, all that. You had to deal with the elements, man. You had to deal with it. So the Puritan families, they'd be pop, they were popping out children like you wouldn't believe. And they were like, look, we have to have children so they can help us around the house. That was literally their thought process. You know, the Puritans were like, we are going to have children, not because we love children, not because we want to start a family, but because we need help around this damn house. That's what we're going to do. So as soon as a child could walk, he or she was put to the test to do these jobs. You know, as soon as they were like 12 months, oh, you're walking. All right, time for you to go sweep the lawn. 12 months, oh my God, you can walk now. All right, you're going to scrub these floors. So, yeah. Sorry, I was just checking on my dog. He's so cute. Aww. So, Puritan families also made religious Bible study and education high priority. So, they're like, look, you, we need to read. And we need to be talking about Jesus and God. Like, our lives would need to be revolving around Jesus and God. Like, yes. So, because they were so, you know, they just loved reading and writing and all that. The Like, the literacy levels in the Puritan society were, like, sky high. Like, so, like, high up there. It was, like, amazing levels for back then. So... But unfortunately, you know, back in the 1600s, they always had those gender roles, you know, like the stereotypical women in the kitchen, the men go out and work, all that stuff. So everything in their homes were all handmade, like all the clothes, cloths, like every sheets, everything was handmade by the women. The men and the boys, they took care of farming, fixing things around the house and caring for livestock. So they basically did the whole, like, taking care of the farm stuff. So then you had the women and the girls, and their jobs were making soap and cooking and gardening and taking care of the house. So they had to do all those as soon as they could walk. You're like, we're going to be farming today, little boy. You walk in today, we're going to be farming too. We haven't done that shit. So Puritan society and politics were controlled by men. So... They, the men, the Puritan society basically thought that men were the stronger gender and smarter gender and better gender. Now, that wouldn't fly today, I can tell you that much, that would not fly. So, now we're going to be talking about the religious beliefs of the Puritans. And y'all need to sit down because they got some wild ass beliefs, man, they, wow. So, if Puritans were not working, they were either at church or they were praying at home they were always praying they were always like thank you god 
God bless, you know, all that type of stuff, because that's what they were. They, they believed in that stuff. So religion was extremely important to Puritans. It was like their whole life. Like, that's what they needed to do. It was, it was just, you know, they were very godly people. You know, they just loved religion, I guess. And attending church was a major, major priority for the Puritan society. So basically, if you were unable to attend church, like if you were sick or you were dying and you didn't go to church, oh my God, you'd be punished in front of everybody. They'd take you down to that town square and whip you like you wouldn't believe. So they also believed that if anyone who diso disobeyed the um, Puritan beliefs or they strayed away from their Puritan lifestyle, they were considered sinners that would burn in the fires of hell and be damned there for life. And I was like, oh my God. So it was commonplace to see whippings and humiliations publicly after church for people who did not go to church. You know what I'm saying? Like if you didn't attend church, you'd be whipped right in front of the church. And it, that, that just sounds like so embarrassing, so awful. Like it, it just doesn't sound cool, dude. Like why? So in 1692 in Salem, Massachusetts, good Lord, can't talk today. So um, witch hunts had actually originally began back in Europe during the years of 1300 through 1330. And it ended up ending in the late 18th century, thank God. And the last known person who was executed for witchcraft occur occur occurred in Switzerland in the year 1782. And it was nearly a hundred years. That was like 90 years before, like after the Salem, Massachusetts witch trials. So the Salem trials occurred actually very late in the times of witchcraft. So back then, it like the European witch hunts occurred back in the 18, 1580s, the 1590s, 1630s, and the 1640s. A majority of the European like witch hunts actually occurred in Western Germany. France and Northern Italy. Like they, they went everywhere. Oh, and Switzerland, Switzerland too. So they went everywhere. They were trying to get all these people that they thought were witches and oh, whew. Wait till you hear this. So it is believed that during the t that time where they went and did all those like witch trials and everything, that nearly 100,000 to 110,000 people were actually tried for witchcraft. And out of all those people, half of them were actually executed. The witch hunts were efforts to identify who the witches were and rather than going after individuals who are already witches. So they were trying, to, they were like, all oh, these people are already witches, let's find more. Gotta find more who are witches. You know, they were just accusing people left and right of being witches. So, a cure, a cure, uh, oh my God. according to the purists, puritists, a definition of a witch is cons considered to be a follower of Satan who traded their souls for his assistance. And quote, remember I was talking about how they were like super religious and everything? Oh, nay, nay. If you were a witch, you had to be like involved with Satan somehow. Like, woof. We talking like you gotta be talking to Satan. You gotta be talking to Satan himself. Like, Jesus. So the Puritans also believed that they had, like, people who were witches had employed demons and devils to do their dirty work. So they needed to accomplish magical deeds. And these demons could arrive in human form or they can change from one human to another. So they could be trying to impersonate your friends, your family, your neighbors, you, apparently. So that's what they thought. And then they also thought that like these witches traveled through the air to secret marriages and orgies. Yeah, we're talking about orgies. Apparently that was a big bad thing back then too, didn't have sex. So there was actually little doubt that people were actually worshiping Satan, but they, the Puritans still had like this belief in their head that there were all these people out there like, sac like worshiping Satan, sacrificing kids and stuff to Satan. And you know, they have to be witches. Oh my God. So we gonna be talking about the accusations now. So the accusations actually began with suspicions and rumors. So they would just hear like rumors. Hey, did you hear about Margaret? Yeah, Margaret, I think she's a witch. She a witch. Oh. And then that would spread around town. And then they'd go and find Margaret and be like, 
oh, she a witch, and it'll go try, uh, make her go to these trials. Whew. And after these, ac the rumors and the accusations that followed, that would le lead to convictions in front of a court, and the convictions ultimately led to executions. So they were like, bam, 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 they got their stuff laid out in a roll. All their ducks were in a roll. So... The Salem Witch Trials and Executions were actually a combination of church politics, family feuds, and hysterical children. So, I mean, if people didn't like you, and you were like... Okay, so if you were like the head of a church, and you saw a family that you didn't like, you ultimately thought they were witches, and you would want them either burned at the stake, hanged, whatever. And I think that's ridiculous, but hey, you know, that was back then. They didn't have their the right mindset going on back then. So... Hysterical children, you know, that's kids that, you know, they are considered, like, how do I describe hysterical children? Like, they get, they fret and worry and they get anxious. Like, kids are known to have anxiety and stuff, right? Right. So, they would consider anxiety, which they didn't know it was a thing back in the time, to be considered Satanism and, like, they, again, like, talking about, Witches. They would be considered a witch. Like little kids. Oh my god, she's a witch. Uh, uh, Maggie Jr., she's a witch. I know she's three, but oh my god, let's hang her at the stake. Like all that type of stuff. So, we're going to be traveling back in time again to the 17th century. So there was two Salems back in the 17th century. Oh, no, no. We're going to talk about the first Salem. We're going to talk about the second Salem. There was a Salem town. And that was a bustling town that was a commerce-oriented port community on Massachusetts Bay. So that's Salem Town. Then there's Salem Village. And that's a smaller, poorer farmer com community of approximately 500 people. So they don't have a lot of money there. But you got the Salem Town. They, they loaded. They're, you got bankers, prominent people. So, yeah, there's that. So now, moving on to the year 1689. So, there was a man named Samuel Paris, and Samuel Paris was an ex-merchant, and he ended up becoming the pastor of the village's congregational church, which is a, back then was like highly, highly like, you're like God to them, they're like, oh my God, you know, you're in charge, you know, like, you're basically like a walking version of God. And, you know, Paris, Samuel Paris, he had... The, um, he had theological studies at Harvard College. I know Harvard was still a thing back in, like, the 1600s. I think Harvard was actually, create, like, built back in the early 1600s, maybe 1500s. But, you know, Harvard is very prestigious. So the fact that this Samuel dude went there, you know, he was just, he was thought of, like, to be, like, this highly intelligent dude. Which, obviously, if you go to Harvard, you're probably very highly fucking intelligent. But, hey, to each their own. And so he was, whenever he had gone to um, Harvard, he was unable to graduate because he was in the process of changing careers from business to industry. And at that time, it was extremely difficult to do. So he ended up just dropping out of college. So I guess I'm going to Harvard graduate at all now, are you? Paris? Paris? So he had an unortho he had like an orthodox Puritan theology that he had preached and that eventually just like divided the congregation. Like there was people who were for his thoughts and then there was people who were against his thoughts. Like remember I was talking about the Donner Party, there was people who were with that guy and there's people who just want to go off in another direction. So he had insisted that non members of their church just leave this leave. I know you're not a member now, but if you're not here, you need to get the hell out. I don't want you here. We don't want you here. You know, like, basically saying that type of ignorant shit. So, you know, Salem, they they didn't take very fondly to that. You know, they were just like, why are you treating our people like that, dude? Like, what the hell is wrong with you? So, people in Salem, they ended up talking, you know, like, b gossiping about this Paris dude. Like, oh my god, do you know him? Oh my god, is he cool? Yeah, he's a little weird. Samuel Paris? Yeah, we don't like him. So, they ended up being split in half. So, there's people who liked him, and then there's people who didn't like him. So, 
they were considered factions at the time. You either liked them or you didn't. If you didn't, you had some type of political view, and you had another type of political view. And I, I think it's nuts that that act, him as a person, like divided the town in half. Basically talking about this type of shit, like. That's crazy to me. Like, it's kind of offensive to him, you know? So, we go move on now from that Samuel dude, and we're going to talk about the actual stuff that led to the trials. So, there was a lady. Her She was a slave lady, I believe. Her name was Tatuba. I know, Tatuba. That's kind of a weird name. She began selling... You remember Samuel Paris? We were talking about him. He was the big church dude. He was the ex-merchant. He went to... Harvard for a little bit, you know, we were just talking about him. So, he had that slave named Tatuba. And he had her tell the kids stories. And Tatuba ended up telling Samuel Paris's children voodoo stories back in 1689 to 1690. And so, in the family, you know, there's the, uh, Samuel Paris's daughter, Betty. She was nine. His niece, Abigail, was 11. And they had a friend. Her name was Ann Putman Jr. And she was around 12 years old. Like, she was all around their ages, so. The children, you know, you would think that, you know, bringing the, uh, up in the Puritan lifestyle, they would want to be interested in Jesus and God and Bibles and, you know, all that stuff. Like, the Bible fun for people. And they didn't. They ended up becoming very interested in fortune-telling. So they were like, oh my God, tell us our fortune. Like, what's going on? You know, Tatula, help us, please. And that ended up leading to January of 1692 when the kids' behavior started getting very, like, peculiar, like, very odd. And they were described by historians to be juvenile delinquents. End quote. Which I'm not sure if they understand the actual definition of a juvenile delinquent. Which, when I think of juvenile delinquent, I think of people who were in juvie, like, robbed people, killed people at the age of, like, 14 or something. But the fact that they were, like, spazzing out does not make them a juvenile delinquent. But, okay, that was back then, you know. It, it'd be like that. So, they were told that... So, it was it was described that they started, like, having these fits. Right? And, I mean, the fits ended up being like they were screaming on the top of their lungs they were speaking in different languages they made bizarre bizarre sounds they threw things that they shouldn't have been able to lift they contorted their bodies which whenever i read that i was thinking of like contorting their bodies like what the fuck what do you mean contorting your bodies like what do you, what, what did they do that that just gives a whole new meaning to bending over backwards i could tell you that much and they end up complaining of like a biting and pinching sensations like all over their body and then that made them want like start contorting themselves. So they weren't biting themselves. They were just saying they were feeling like they're being bitten and pinched and stung. Like it felt like they were being stung by a bee. So let's move on to what modern scientists think of what actually happened back during the Salem Witch Trials. So these, like, modern scholars, they use science to see why these kids may have been having these strange behaviors. And they're like, you know, it could be asthma. Which, honestly, the coughing and the choking and all, I can understand. But everything else, like contorting of the body and screaming and feeling pinched, I don't see that. I don't. I'm sorry, I don't. And encephalitis I looked that up because I was like what the hell does encephalitis mean so we're gonna look that up later so encephalitis actually is an inflammation of the brain the spinal cord and it was a disease that can control like your nerves and everything so basically that's what they thought it was they also said it could have been convulsive ergotism Lyme disease which I'm not sure where they got that from epilepsy is understandable but Hey, I don't think that you can't just, like, magically start having seizures like that, me With all, everybody at the same time? Child abuse, which, like I said, pe they were people of God. So child abuse was highly frowned upon back then. Like, that was, like, 
Ooh. They thought of child abuse as like Satan possessing your mind. So if you abuse a child, you're basically possessed by Satan. So that's interesting. So they also thought it could have been like ergo. So they basically were like, it could be ergo, which is a disease that is caused by eating bread or cereal made out of a type of rye that was infected by the fungus, ergo. And ergo can cause vomiting, choking fits, hallucination, and the sense of something crawling on your skin, which kind of makes sense that they would think that. Because if they feel like they're being pinched and bit and everything, so, oh, and hallucinations, they could not, probably don't understand what's really going on here. So, <coughs> sorry, I'm coughing. So due to the rapid spread of the behavior of the young girls and these young women, you know, the explanations that they were told were like about the Lyme disease, the child abuse, the psychosis, whatever. They weren't convinced. They were like, mm, oh, dang, dang, that can't be, that can't be real. Oh, mm, y'all lying. There has to be some other type of explanation. Witches. So, they were like, oh, no, no, no. So, the same behavior actually had occurred four years ago in Boston, Massachusetts, in a family, and they were believed to have been bewitched. I'm using quotations because, like, who's to say, like, they were or they weren't? But that's just what they claimed is that they were bewitched. And in February, there was a doctor named William Griggs, and he was unable to find out medically, like, what the hell was going on with them. They were like, mm, oh, what's going on here? And he was like, it's me. So the neighbor had, a neighbor had suggested to Tatuba, the slave that did voodoo magic or whatever, to bake a cake to unwitch the girls to you know, break them of their possessions or whatever. So, Tatuba, she baked the cake because she was told to. And, you know, back then, slaves would have been whipped if they didn't listen. And it didn't do anything to help, but it really, really highly upset the Reverend Samuel Paris. You know, we're talking about that dude back there, the church dude, the Reverend. And he automatically assumed, like, oh my god, you're making a cake to stop this? Satanic! Like, he literally thought it was satanic, and they were... He, the uh, Tatuba was being told by Satan to bake a cake to possess his girls or whatever. And I'm, I'm sorry to say that, like, or whatever, but, like, the dude had to be on something because, like, if someone bakes me a cake or whatever to help someone feel better, like, automatically thinking that she was possessed by the devil or the devil told her to do it. That doesn't make any fucking sense to me. Like, what the hell? Y'all tripping. Y'all tr you, you tripping, Paris. You tripping. Mr. Sam Paris. Oh, Paris. Not Paris. Paris. Mr. Paris, you, you trip in there. So, Betty and Abigail, the two girls, were pressured by Samuel Paris to say who did this to them. He was like, look, what the fuck happened here? Who did this to you? Who made you into a witch? Who did this? What the hell's going on here, man? Like, what's, what's happening? What is going on? So, they, the girls just claimed to, they were like, look, we were possessed by Tituba, Sarah Good, and Sarah Osborne. I'm telling y'all, it's, it's them. They did it. And everyone was like completely convinced that they, it was them based off of the fact that none of them attended church regularly. So because they didn't attend church regularly, they had to be the ones that put the, possess, the, that possessed them and put all this bewitchment on them. Right? Right. Okay. All right. All right, Samuel Paris. You do what you want to do. So on March 1st, there was uh, two magistrates from Salem Town. Their names are John Hawthorne and Jonathan Carwin. Corwin. Corwin. Sorry, Corwin. I can't remember my hand right. They went to the village to talk to the accused witches, right? So both Sarah Good and Sarah Osborne claimed they were innocent. So Sarah Good ended up blaming Sarah Osborne. And she was just like, look, it, it's her, it's her. And Sarah Osborne was just like, what the fuck's going on, right? She didn't claim, she didn't say it was anybody. Like, she was just, like, super confused, which honestly, I would have been hella confused, too. 
I would have been very, very confused if someone would have told me I was a witch. I'd be like, what do you mean I'm a witch? What do you mean? What are you talking about? So, Tatuba, she was said to have no involvement in all of this. But she was begged to admit if she was a witch. You know, they were just like, are you a witch? Are you a witch? And she told them that, in her own words, she was visited by the devil and made a um, deal with the devil. And then she started describing what Satan looked like by his animalistic features. And then she said that a tall, dark man from Boston had a Boston accent asked her to sign the devil's book. Well, she could have been lying the whole time. She could have just pulled this out of her ass and acted like it was legit. But, you know, back then, they were just like, oh shit, you know, she saw Satan's book. Oh my god. And, get this, in the devil's book, she claimed to see both Sarah Good's name in it and Sarah Osborne, the two other people accused of witch being uh, witches and accused of witchcraft and all that. Oh, yeah, she was throwing shade at everybody. She gave no shits. Not only was there a confession, con like, considered a confession to them, but then they had more, like, there's apparently more witches in Salem, so, like, because they got the two Sarah's names, and they're like, oh, shit, oh, my God, it's spreading. And people became, like, hysteric. Like, they couldn't go anywhere or leave their house. They started accusing their friends, their family members. They were like, oh, everyone's a witch. I can't go anywhere. You're a witch. I don't trust you. They even started, like, claiming that their dogs and cats and horses were fucking witches. All right, I'm, I want to know what they're smoking because they all some good shit if they're thinking that. So, other girls and other women, young women at the time, started like experiencing these fits and contortions as well. And not only are at first it was like the people that are being accused are like these poor, homely looking people, but ended up actually like being prominent members of society. Like it started going downhill real quick. So, we're going to talk about the trial. So, the first trial actually occurred on May 27th of 1692. So, that's like a hell of a long time ago. Like, whoa. Whoa, like 500 years almost. And um, the governor of Massachusetts Bay Colony, his name was Sir William Phipps. P-H-I-P-S. Phipps. And he ordered the courts to hear and decide on Salem Town. Like, what the hell is going on in there? They, like, they're like, what the fuck is happening? Like, the witches. Like, what's happening? So, the court consisted of seven judges. They were all male, of course, because, you know, you couldn't have women in the court. And the accused were forced to not have any aid from the council. So, they couldn't have any way to represent themselves because they were women and they were accused of being witches. All right. And then there was even the admission of spectral evidence. Like, people actually seeing this. They admitted to seeing this evidence of Satan and his work. And that was the, you know, the claims of, like, the young children saying they had been bitten and felt like they were being stung and scratched and attacked. And then these victims, these other people, are saying that these people that were possessed by Satan and became witches, they were saying that, they, that the witches attacked them. See, if they beat them up and, you know, attack them and all that stuff. And saying that Satan used them to uh, work his evil magic, end quote. So. Hmm. I'm going to take a deep breath because this is going to get wild as fuck in just a second. So, the people who were accused, they were squirming because obviously they were nervous as shit. I'd be nervous. In all honesty, I'd be fucking nervous. And they were crying and they were whimpering. Like, they were so upset. They were like, what the fuck is going on here? And because they were doing all that, that provided all the evidence they needed that they were demonically possessed. Because they were crying and whimpering. Okay. Okay, Salem. And those who confessed to being witches, they were spared of any type of punishment. As long as they said, like, hey, I'm a witch. Be like, all right, cool. Bye. And they were told that God would punish them for being with the devil or whatever. God will end your life quickly. <laughs> but those who said they were innocent were treated like shit, dude. Like, it was bad. Then, um, on June 2nd, the first official conviction of the crime of being a witch was of Bridget Bishop. And she had been previously convicted 
a witchcraft 12 years earlier. But she was like, yo, no, I'm not a witch, man. I'm not. But they didn't believe her. And they ended up hanging her at the gallows on June 10th of 1692 in Salem Village. So they had like the Gallows Hill, which is where they did all the hangings and stuff. So not only did that happen, but then everybody went crazy and was just started hanging people. I'm gonna get to that in a second. So on July 19th, five more people were hanged, including that Sarah Good person we were just talking about. And she then told the judge that she was no more of a witch than he was a wizard, which is honestly, yes, queen. Let them know. Clap back, sis. Let them know what's up. So, then there was a guy named George Burroughs, and he was the Salem minister at the time from 1680 to 1683. You know, he just stopped being a minister not too long ago. And he was being accused of being the witch, witch's ringleader, being in charge of them and teaching them their witched ways. And he was actually convicted and hanged with four others on August 19th of 1692. So they hung him. They were just hanging everybody. They really were. They were losing their damn minds. So now we're going to fast forward to September 22nd of 1692. So there was eight more people that were actually hanged. And included someone named Martha Carey and her husband Giles was also accused of witchcraft. And he was pressed between these two stones until he was crushed to death. That sounds like a harsh punishment. Instead of hanging him, they put him between these stones and he died from being crushed. Whew, some shit just went down there. Then we're going to move to October 29th. So October 29th, like, the witchcraft accusations actually start including the governor of Massachusetts' own wife. And he actually stepped in and was like, no, we need to stop. We need to stop these hangings, man. This is ridiculous. This has gone too far. And we're done. No. No. Which honestly kind of upset me because I was just like, so you're going to step in? Only when your wife is accused, but not when, like, all these other innocent people are being accused? You're just gonna act like that? Oh, so it doesn't matter that they're all dead, but as long as your wife is alive, it's that's important? Okay. Okay. Whatever. So, the trials ended up resuming again in January and February of 1693. But only three out of the 56 people that were convicted, like were uh, accused and tried, were convicted. So the other, like, 53 people were like, yeah, no, we're not witches. Bye, bitches. Bye, bitches. We ain't no witches. Yeah. So, in May of 1693, thank fucking God, the trials came to an end. Thank God for that. Because they they finally caught some common sense and realized all these people are not uh, witches. So, hmm. What's said bitches? Witches. Witches. So... At the end of all of that, nearly 19 people were hanged for being witches. So, that is a story today of the Salem Witch Trials. Please like, comment, subscribe to my channel. Let me know what your thoughts down below in the comments. Share this video with your friends. Tell your friends to subscribe. And I will see you all in my next video. Bye-bye.